We make fun of Jeep and Jeep owners a lot on our Instagram. We can't help it, it's too fun. But why is it funny? Jeep is one of the most popular American brands to ever exist. People love how they look, how capable they are, and the attention they get when they're in one. Driving a Jeep is a statement that you love to go off the beaten path. But with the good attention, Jeep also gets a fair amount of hate. So, what makes Jeep so divisive? Are they too good? What's going on? Thanks to Keeps for sponsoring today's episode. My Uncle Jerry was two of a kind. And by that, I mean he was one of the two out of three guys experiencing some form of male pattern baldness by the time he was 35. He loved legs, his ex-girlfriend Jerry with a G, but most of all, he loved his best bird, Dave. Dave, please say a few words. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Did you know Dave was a girl? Uncle Jerry was my best friend. We sold fireworks together, went camping, even drove across the country to Cabo. But instead of crying over his loss, let's celebrate his life, a good life, one that he'd still be living if he had used Keeps. Keeps makes hair loss prevention easy by shipping your hair loss medication directly to your door every three months. Plus you get access to real doctors online. So don't mourn the loss of your follicles. Start your hair loss prevention today by going to keeps.com slash wheelhouse 50 or by clicking the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. He may have been called Uncle Jerry, but he was a friend, Jerry, to us all. In order to understand the love-hate relationship with Jeeps, it's important to know how and why they were created in the first place. Jeep hater history stretches all the way back to World War II, which changed history in immeasurable ways, one of those being technology. Not so many years ago, the automobile was considered a luxury. When America entered the war in December of 1941, we brought support in the form of troops, firepower, and technology. One of the biggest factors for victory at the time was the ability to move information and ground forces, and that meant transportation was key. While the military did have access to some pretty fast and agile motorcycles, only the best riders were capable of conquering the rough terrain that forces were facing in war-torn Europe. Makeshift roads were treacherous, often with no marked path at all. During World War I, the vehicles available to the military ranged from horses and wagons to commandeered civilian vehicles. So this time around, the military was looking for a true general purpose vehicle. They had a very specific idea in mind for their ideal mass-produced off-road war machine, and their requirements for the project left a lot of manufacturers scratching their head. See what I did there? Anyone who wanted to secure the contract would have to build a working prototype with four-wheel drive, room for three or more, plus a 30 caliber machine gun, a payload of 600 pounds, all within a weight limit of 1,300 pounds total. That seems insane nowadays, but it's more insane to think that they expected this 80 years ago. The only three car companies that responded to the call were Willis Overland, Ford, and Bantam. And the kicker? They had just 49 days to make it happen. Bantam was the only manufacturers that met the deadline with the Bantam Pilot, a light 4x4 recon and scout vehicle powered by a 45 horsepower Continental four-cylinder engine. Unfortunately, it did not meet the weight limit at 2,030 pounds, a good 700 pounds over Army specifications. But the committee was willing to overlook the extra weight due to the incredible amount of interest the hand-built pilot car nicknamed the Blitz Buggy had generated on its way to the testing facility. Upon arriving to the test, right under the half an hour mark before the deadline, one of the first things the Army did was hand over all of Bantam's technical drawings to Willis Overland and Ford, who had yet to roll in their own prototypes. This did Bantam absolutely no favors and stirred up even more competition in the race to get the contract. Prototypes began rolling in from all three companies, including multiple revisionary models from Bantam, Willie's Quad, and Ford's Pygmy. So despite a lot of the initial design having originated from Bantam's prototypes and an almost indiscernible mix of contributions from all three companies, ultimately the majority of the contract went to Willis Overland for their Go Devil Quad. Not one to be left out, the Ford company also manufactured a portion of the military vehicles within the limits of a smaller contract. The winning Go Devil design had an engine with 60 horsepower and 105 foot-pounds of torque, making it the most powerful of the prototypes in the running. Willis's Go Anywhere, Do Anything vehicle, the predecessor of the MB, CJ series, and Wrangler, had quickly become the go-to general purpose vehicle of the Army. Some sources say that it took on the name Jeep after shortening general purpose, GP. 
Some say it was derived from a comic strip character, but regardless of where it actually came from, the name Jeep stuck and started becoming synonymous with rugged, versatile, nearly indestructible military vehicles. After the war, there were plenty of military personnel who wanted to take one home having seen their performance on the battlefield. The now iconic grill-fronted devil had driven its way off the road and into the hearts of those who served after being credited with helping Allied forces win the war. Willis Overland was not going to lose the opportunity to capitalize on this demand. Ford's contract had ended with the military and Willis Overland had sole rights to the Jeep designs. Willis Overland jumped on the chance to sell more vehicles, not just to vets who had used them, but to civilians as well. They started marketing these cars to farmers, promoting the many accessories such as plows that could be bought and attached to the civilian Jeep or CJ2A. The CJ2A, marketed as the Jeep Universal, differed from the military Jeep in a number of ways. In addition to the seven slot grills, as opposed to the nine slot in the military design, the CJ had bigger headlights, a tailgate, a spare tire was put on the right side, and the passenger side got an upgrade to an automatic windshield wiper. The top speed was boosted by five miles an hour to 60, and with better shocks, improved cooling, and softened springs, it was an overall improvement in comfort for the civilian market. There were a ton of configurations and options to make it desirable for everyone, from farmers to fire departments to landscapers, alongside the general population that just wanted something more durable to drive. With a little more leisure time available to more Americans, the concept of taking the Jeep off-road was becoming a very popular one for fishermen and outdoorsmen overall. The marketing was successful and over 214,000 were built through 1949. Then Willis Overland finally trademarked the Jeep name in 1950. Willis Overland would continue to make improvements and crank out CJ models. The CJ5 arrived in 1955 and much more closely resembles the Wrangler we know today. With an 81 inch wheelbase, more passenger room and a rear bench seat, the ride was more approachable for a daily driver. You could justify having this thing in your garage. After adding some chrome surrounds for the headlights, a rounded front fender, a better fitted top, the CJ5 remained in production until 1983 after a total of 603,000 were built. Following some additional CJs, Kaiser Industry Corporation sold Jeep to AMC in 1969. After years of development by AMC, it was almost time for the next leap for Jeep. The Jeep Wrangler roared onto the scene in 1987, showing people that you could have a real off-roader that could also be a real family vehicle. It wasn't all smiles, though. The Jeep brand had taken some heat from national news organization 60 Minutes for being too easy to roll over, and investors were starting to grow wary of the changes of ownership, so they needed this model to work. With adjustments to the body for improved safety, including a perimeter frame, semi-elliptical leaf springs, and a front stabilizer bar, the Wrangler was offered with multiple options up to 112 horsepower. Over 632,000 of these were built through 1985, leading to many more iterations of the Wrangler models, which would begin to appear everywhere you looked. But was this actually a bad thing? Doesn't sound like it. Popular culture has always taken notice of the Jeep, but as the decades and models evolved, the demographics for the audience were no longer limited to veterans, farmers, or the off-roading enthusiast. Everybody wanted a Jeep. A 1979 Jeep CJ7 nicknamed Dixie was driven by Daisy Duke in the show Dukes of Hazard. Another white Wrangler showed up in Clueless, introducing the idea of a younger female Jeep driver. Women had been featured prominently in Jeep ads in previous decades, but only as passengers. Of course, we can't forget Martin McFly hanging onto the CJ7 while riding a skateboard in Back to the Future, or the Wrangler YG that flew and or hovered in Back to the Future 2. The classic non-flying Wrangler YJ was also the model featured in Jurassic Park, shout out John Cerrone, because what other than an orange striped Wrangler could be capable of slogging through mud, rocks, and jungles while outrunning dinosaurs. But it wasn't just showing up in movies. The music industry was betting on the growing market for music videos, and Jeep was too. Featured in everything from Britney Spears' Hit Me Baby One More Time to LL Cool J's Backseat, the Jeep was becoming synonymous with younger, more modern culture and interest than its original military roots. Listen carefully to Biggie's Everyday Struggle and you'll hear him refer to both Land Cruisers and Jeeps with the line, Toyota Dealathon had it cheap on the Jeeps, which doesn't really make sense and I'm sure I butchered the flow, I'm sorry. Taking advantage of the momentum the inclusion in pop culture had built for the brand, Jeep continued to reinvent the Wrangler with more upgrades, features, and power. 
But Jeep wasn't the only one watching the market trends, and the brand's notoriety was in some ways becoming its downfall, as other car manufacturers began sneaking very Jeep-like designs into their own models. One company you might recognize was not only inspired by Jeeps, but also literally built their prototypes on a Jeep axle and chassis. The 1948 Land Rover was designed by an engineer who had used Jeeps on his farm, and even the much more modern Land Rovers carry on some of Jeep's characteristics. One of them being unreliability. Zing. Uh, <laughs> but wait, wasn't Jeep supposed to be super reliable? Wasn't that the point in the first place? What the heck happened? The brand is constantly boasting its adventurous off-road nature and capabilities, still marketing itself like the indestructible military-grade vehicle it once was. The problem is, that's not really the case. <laughs> Ask a Jeep owner, they'll know. It's not hard to see the irony in the fact that the element that brought the Jeep into fruition, technology, is also what has allowed other companies to catch up and outdo Jeep at its own game. Jeep's original models were designed to do hard work in a time when automobiles in general were still a fairly new concept. So doing anything outside of going from point A to point B was an innovation, and Jeep really did that differently. Jeep started trends that are still evident and alive today. Take a look at the Toyota Land Cruiser. It too has military roots in the Korean War when the U.S. still occupied Japan and urged the island nation to produce a military vehicle domestically. By 1951, they had the Toyota Jeep BJ, obviously inspired by the military spec Jeeps driven by U.S. forces stationed in Japan. Toyota renamed the vehicle to the Land Cruiser and began selling it under that name in the U.S. in 1958. The 2016 Wrangler Unlimited Hard Rock mostly lives up to its Jeep reputation. I, it's pretty damn good. It's got Dana axles. It's powered by a 3.6 liter Pentastar V6, putting out 285 horsepower and 260 foot-pounds of torque and an optional five-speed automatic transmission. It's outfitted pretty damn well for off-roading, but Land Cruiser beats out the Wrangler by giving the 200 series model a 5.7 liter V8 to gain 381 horsepower and 401 foot-pounds of torque in an eight-speed automatic. They overshadowed the Jeep's power by almost 100 horsepower and they added features that really upped the off-road capabilities. The full-time four-wheel drive system defaults to a 40-60 front rear split, paired with a torsion-limited slip locker center differential, sending the torque to the axles for more grip on rough terrain. But on top of the capability, it's also got luxury features like really nice seats and a refrigerator. It truly lives up to an outdoorsman expectations and then some. Wherever these vehicles come from, they all share the off-roading origin with the all-American go-anywhere Jeep. So with that many copycats, we must all love Jeeps, right? Well, sort of. Successful sales of anything that resembles a Jeep tells us the iconic look is something we love. It says something about who you are, an identity with offered and culture. But even that has its splits, subcultures, and infighting. There are countless Jeep jamborees that happen any time of year all over the country for Jeep owners to meet up and check out each other's rides and swap stories and tips and whatever. But according to one Jeep owner and former Jamboree attendee, even those can be pretty competitive and there's some hostility between stock Jeep enthusiasts, vintage Jeep owners, and those who go all out modifying their ride. There are some elements of the Jamboree culture that have since deterred her from joining up, including the feeling that the competition was more money driven than fun driven and whoever spent the most on their Jeep had somehow stolen the show. But just take a look back at the pop culture appearances to see how different the demographics really are for Jeep drivers. The same people running out to look at white Jeeps that Matt shares and Clueless probably aren't the same people who are planning week-long camping trips that require off-road uphill climbs. I mean, maybe they are, but I've seen Jeeps that are so beat up they can't leave the driveway until someone scrapes away the mud to fix whatever axle broke going over the boulder last week. But on the other hand, we've all seen them there are a whole lot of very shiny, squeaky clean Jeeps out on the roads that don't look like they do any more climbing than into and out of the driveway. There's a term for it, a pavement princess, a, a, a trailer queen, a, a mall crawler. Does that play into why Jeeps get hate? That poser factor? Well, maybe, but there's also the fact that Jeeps are just super popular. They're everywhere and it's fun to make fun of popular things like Coldplay or Tom Brady. You can't get away from Tom Brady's face. He's everywhere. But you also can't argue with the results. Back when we were shooting the finale of Hilo, we took our built Tacomas through the Poughkeepsie Gulch Trail, a pretty serious route that demanded careful driving and off-road tires at the very least. Our trucks were able to do it, mostly. 
But what you didn't see in that episode was our production vehicle that held all of our cameras and gear, a bone stock Jeep Wrangler Limited rolling on some BF Goodrich KO2 tires. The Jeep was able to do everything that Tacomas did, except for the final obstacle, without a, a locking rear differential, and that blew my mind. This was the same car you see every day on the streets of LA, making us look stupid for spending so much money on our trucks. And that's when I understood. Sure, some Jeeps may never see a trail, but that doesn't mean it can't perform when the time comes. Those mall crawlers with like two inch profile tires, they'll probably still do pretty damn well. So regardless of why we love to hate Jeeps, uh, they've certainly made their way into the cultural zeitgeist and have left their seven slot grill mark. They're a true American marvel that was built to be tough, built to overtake impossible challenges and overcome any obstacle put in front of its four wheel drive way. Whether you're waxing on weekends or driving it through mud, you're still driving a Jeep and that's part of our history. So Jeep enthusiast, Jeep hater, whoever you are, we can all appreciate it for what it is, a phenomenal meme generator. Follow us on Instagram, at Donut Media, if you want to see some Jeep memes. Uh, truth be told, man, like, they're super capable, dude. You can't argue with the results. Great cars. They're not the best on the road, I will say. I would not buy one for a daily driver. But, off-road, amazing. Let me know what you think of Jeeps down in the comments. Did this video help sway your opinion a little bit? Let me know. I want to know. Truly. Follow me on social media, at Nolan J. Sykes. If you'd like, be kind. Don't litter on the trail. I'll see you next time.